so far what we have seen as you know various things about how you can represent data flow graphs and represent tsp systems in terms of data flow graphs do some analysis on them uh, and you know come up with uh, bounds on what can be achieved and also some ways by which we can look at improving the schedulability of those data flow graphs right i mean by using transformations like pipelining retiming parallelism and so on at the end of the day what we are interested in is to come up with some kind of a schedule right and what we meant by a schedule was we have some amount of hardware that's been allocated to us we want to take all the operations that need to be executed put them on to the hardware and uh, specify the time instance at which those things need to be executed okay what i'm going to do today is to sort of see how do we generalize that idea right and we will try to build up through that uh, you know that question i mean by asking that question how do we generalize that idea we'll try and build up the idea of how do we build a general purpose processor okay and from there we will then move on to the idea of what is compilation how do we write code compile it what are the things that need to be done in that process and so on essentially what we have is the hardware units which actually do the computations are called the data path so for example you know the multipliers adders and so on would be the data path okay and those are typically all the computational elements in the circuit they have a fixed functionality right you give it a certain input it will always generate the same output an example of that would be a multiplier right you give it two inputs give it some amount of time whatever it is that is needed by it and it will generate the same output control on the other hand does not do any computation by itself okay so in fact that's one thing to keep in mind i mean typically what you would have is you would not have things like adders multipliers and so on in the control part of the circuitry you might have some minimal things just for doing some comparisons or something of that sort but very often what we find is even the comparisons and so on are done in the data path and only a signal is provided to the control which is then used in order to decide what to do okay and what the control part of the circuit needs to do is to provide appropriate inputs to the data path okay in particular it needs to keep track of the time that is how many clock cycles have passed and to schedule operations in other words find out at which time instant uh, are we currently can we move uh, you know do this particular operation can we move on to the next step and so on okay i'll be sort of taking a much more detailed example and hopefully it will become clear in the process okay and the example that we are going to study is one that hopefully you are all somewhat familiar with by now it's the differential equation solver okay so you know you remember this task graph right basically what we have over here is uh, six multiplication operations and if you look at the top you will notice that i have actually labeled all the inputs to each of the multipliers and uh, adders right so c1 into x into u into dx is being done on the left hand side and you know uh, u minus that then that minus c2 into y into dx and so on okay so pretty much all the computations i'm not going to go over that again this we will take as an example of a task graph or data flow graph that needs to get scheduled on to some limited amount of hardware okay by the way i mean i'm once again you know using these terms task graph and data flow graph sort of interchangeably at the end of the day what you need to keep in mind is data flow graph by itself refers to the idea that each of the elements inside the graph behaves in a data flow manner right it receives some input it performs computation and generates output and all of the data is basically connected between such nodes by means of edges and it's just it is that transfer of data through the graph that is responsible for doing the computation that we have the term task graph comes from a different context it is sort of more from the operations research and scheduling point of view but you know you can see the similarities i can just think of each of these multiplications and additions as a task to be done okay so most of the time i and sometimes i will use these terms interchangeably right most of the time it is clear from the context whether there is anything specific that i need to keep in mind uh, if there is then you know i usually elaborate on that a little bit otherwise just these are common terms all right so this is the same task graph that we had earlier right and we have been through how we can schedule this in different ways asap alap uh, finite resources uh, list based scheduling all of those we looked at i am now 
marking the in inputs to the system and giving them some new names right so i'm basically calling c1 as i0 x as i1 u as i2 and so on and effectively what i can see in this way is that i have six inputs uh, sorry seven inputs to the system right c1 x u dx c2 y and a okay these are seven distinct inputs that are taken by this entire unit in order to perform one computation now as you know the x u and y are in turn once again updated by this computation and will then be fed back as the next for the next iteration right the c1 dx and c2 are constants and a are constants which you could also just have hard coded in but for completeness i am taking them as something which is provided from outside so it's another input to the entire system okay so if we have this then basically what we can do is you know once again i can label the rest of them I have, the reason i put it in parenthesis is because these are duplicates right they already have a name i didn't want to sort of mess up the diagram by connecting them all over the place so i've just you know put the corresponding name above the variable now i'm introducing a few new names okay so you can see that i have something called r0 right which is the output of the first multiplier right and r0 basically correspond and you know it's just a name that i'm using for a temporary variable okay i'm basically saying that the product of i0 into i1 that is c1 into x is stored into some placeholder right most likely it might be a register right or it might also just be a wire which basically holds the value of the multiplication output right and similarly we have r1 which is the output of u into dx okay now further when i look at the next multiplication after that i need to do r0 into r1 here i am taking a bit of a shortcut right i am saying that okay i will just reuse the value r0 over here right technically this is not entirely correct ideally what i should be doing is introducing a new variable name over here or you know just call it a net name right it does not really matter even if i called it i mean in this particular case the fact that i can use r0 it is hopefully intuitively obvious to all of you why you know it does not matter because anyway i have just used r0 i am not going to have that old value I'm, i don't need that old value again anywhere else which is why i am reusing r0 at the output of the multiplier as well right but to keep things safe i could have called it r2 or r3 or r4 some other name right in fact what we will find when we sort of i mean or rather i'm not going to get into too much detail on the compiler part of it but there is something called static single assignment form where the idea is that any given value or variable or such name that you introduce will get assigned a value only once right that is it's got a single assignment so once i assign a value to r0 let's say i assign i0 into i1 to r0 i can never assign a new value to r0 okay now that form of writing code or writing variable names actually has some very interesting properties because it allows us to analyze some parts of the graph very neatly and to actually you know uh, avoid uh, in, or rather reduce some kinds of dependency analysis and make them very easy to do right now i'm sort of taking the slightly more intuitive approach one that we would readily understand where i'm basically saying that you know this corresponds to something like uh, this statement is basically saying r0 is equal to r0 into r1 right and we understand what that means what i'm saying is the old value of r0 is multiplied by the old value of r1 and is assigned as the new value of r0 okay and so on so i have r0 r1 r2 r3 and r4 okay so these are just some you can call them registers you can call them placeholders you can call them variables whatever you want okay for the time being so now that i've done all of this what can i sort of do further with this graph i am just for completeness you know i'm also assigning names to these uh, operations m1 m2 m3 etc right so there are six multiplications and five addition slash subtraction slash comparison operations right i'm clubbing them all together as a single type of operation they are either addition or subtraction or comparison they can be done on the same piece of hardware essentially 
moving ahead with this, we have given all these names, right? M1 to M6 and uh, A1 to A5. Now, what do we do with this? Okay. So, I have just sort of shrunk that image a little bit onto the left hand side, right? Uh, and uh, what we have with the image on the left hand side is it's exactly a copy of what we had on the previous screen, right? What I'm trying to do now is to say, supposing I have only one multiplication or rather one multiplier and one adder, right? So my hardware essentially corresponds to two units, right? There's one multiplier and one adder, okay? And the right hand side of the slide essentially is trying to sort of put down details of at each instant of time, what should be provided as inputs to the multiplier, what should be provided as inputs to the adder, and where does the output of the multiplier go, where does the output of the adder go. Okay, that's what I want to sort of tabulate over there. So let's move forward with that. What we can say, for example, is, right, I'm just building up a schedule on the fly as we move through over here, right, I haven't yet given a schedule, okay. But I'm sort of building it up by saying some kind of, you know, list based, you know, I just take whatever is the ready node at any given point and just put that onto the uh, operations. So at time zero, one thing that I can do is I can schedule M1. Okay. So operation M1 is scheduled on the hardware M and operation A4 is scheduled on hardware A. What are the inputs to M1? It is I0 and I1, right? Basically C1 and X. Okay. So I0 and I1 those two inputs are fed in as in1 and in2 of the multiplier m and the output is r0 okay all right next time instant at time 1 i can do for example m2 right i could also have done m4 or m6 but i am just picking m2 uh, what are the inputs to m2 i2 and i3 its output is r1 okay what are the uh, and on the adder I correspondingly do A5, okay? What are the inputs to A5? One of the inputs is R4, which I just computed in the previous cycle. And the other input is I6, which is A, okay? And the output once again is R4 itself because of, you know, the fact that I'm reusing variable names. Move forward to the next time step. Now, what I have is M3 can get scheduled on the multiplier Okay, what are the inputs to M3? It's R0 and R1 and output is R0. And at that time instant, I find that I don't have any operations that I can schedule on the adder. So I'm just leaving it blank. Okay. Move forward to time step three. I can schedule M4 on the multiplier. Its inputs are I4 and I5, output is R2. And now because I've already finished M3, I can schedule A1 onto the adder, right? The inputs are I2 and R0 and output is R0, okay. Move forward at time step 4, I have the multiplier M5. At time step 5, I have multiplier M6 as well as add operation A2, okay. Because remember M5 has completed, therefore A2 is now ready to go, right. And A2 takes as input R0 which is coming from A1 and R2 which is coming from M5 does the subtraction in this case and stores the result in R0, okay. So you'll notice that as far as the A hardware is concerned, I am actually not specifying whether it's an add or a subtract or a compare, right. I need to actually have an additional column out there which also specifies that, okay. So moving forward, what I have is at the last time step, that is time 6, the only operation remaining is A3, okay. One input is I5, the other input is R3 and the output is R3 itself, okay. At this time instant, there are no multiplication operations to be done. All right, uh, so this looks good. Essentially, what it's saying is I have managed to build up a schedule, right, uh, very straightforward uh, enough to build this up. Now, what I'm going to try and do is to see how I can convert this into equivalent hardware, right. Now, one thing you will notice is, right, strictly speaking, those columns marked op where I've written M1, M2, M3, etc. I don't really need to specify that anywhere, right? Even if I had only the other three columns in one, in two and out, right? That's enough to make sure that my computation proceeds correctly, okay? 
as long as i0 is connected to c1, i1 is connected to x and so on, right? I don't really care whether this is doing operation m1 in the graph or what that operation was called, right? I only need to know what the inputs are and the corresponding output. So that column, in other words, marked op is nice for us to understand, but is not required. 